you know, the old Winston Churchill quote about, you know, if you're going through hell, keep going. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've been through hell. And I, I don't think anybody would would look at me and look at my experience and say that I haven't been. But but I don't look at it as, you know, oh, woe is me. This terrible thing happened to me. Yeah, this terrible thing happened to me and it made me a better person. Hey everyone, I'm Luke and welcome to another episode of Exploring Kodawari. Our guest for this episode was author and motivational speaker Terry Tucker. Terry has had quite the life with careers ranging from hospital administrator to SWAT hostage negotiator to undercover narcotics officer. But after being diagnosed with a rare form of cancer in 2012, Terry was forced onto a very different path. And unfortunately to this day, that path of battling cancer has continued for him. Most recently, after a tumor required his leg to be amputated, he also found out that he has tumors in both his lungs. Unfortunately, his doctors don't really talk about cure, but about buying more time. But what's so inspiring about Terry is that he continues to fight on and with a remarkable perspective and energy. He's one of those people that managed to take their suffering and turn it into some deep life wisdom. He started a website and blog called Motivational Check, And last year, he published a book titled Sustainable Excellence, 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. So in this episode, we talk about his life story, his book, and many other topics. We talk about suffering, love, religion, stoicism, and other fundamental truths that he lives his life by. We especially got into the topic of resentment. That is, how can can you avoid becoming resentful towards life even in the face of extremely unfair suffering? Overall, it was a really inspiring conversation, and like I say in the episode, considering his life situation, the wisdom he gives feels all the more important and true. I think when someone gets tested, when someone gets tested by reality like he has, it really goes to show just how important it is to live with the philosophy of life. All right, as always, if you enjoy the podcast and blog and would like to support us, and also to help us find the time to put out more content please consider clicking through to our support page where you can donate through our secure PayPal links and our genuine thanks to those of you who have already supported us. But mostly, thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoy this episode with Terry Tucker. All right, well, Terry Tucker, thanks so much for coming on Exploring Kodawari. Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. So um, I figured we could start with the logical place of you giving your background, um, and you know, I'll, I'll give a short version of it in the intro, but you can give a more personal version of your story and and you know what you're up to the last few years. Okay, so I was born and raised in Chicago. I'm the oldest of three boys. You you can't tell this by looking at me, but I'm six foot eight inches tall, <laughs> and I played college basketball at the Citadel in South Carolina. I have a brother who's six foot seven who pitched at Notre Dame. And then I have another brother who's six foot six, who played for the Cleveland Cavaliers in the NBA. And then my dad was six, five. So if you sat behind our family in church growing up, not a prayer's <laughs> chance you were going to see anything that was going on. Wow. Uh, then of course my mom was like five, eight and she was the boss anyway. So it, it really didn't matter how big or, or strong we were, whatever mom said when. So athletics, specifically basketball was an important part of my life growing up. And as I said, I went to college at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina on a basketball scholarship, despite having three knee surgeries in high school. When I graduated from college, I moved home to find a job. Um, this was long before the internet was available. Uh, fortunately, I did find that first job in the marketing department at the corporate headquarters of Wendy's International, the hamburger chain. Mm-hmm. Uh, but unfortunately, I ended up living with my parents for the next three and a half years as I helped my mother care for my grandmother and my father, who were both dying of different forms of cancer. Mm -hmm. Uh, In my professional career, as I mentioned, I was a marketing executive. I was a hospital administrator, hospital administrator, a customer service manager. I was a police officer. I was an undercover narcotics investigator. I was a SWAT team hostage negotiator. I had a school security consulting business. It's almost like you sampled careers like people sample (laughs) ice cream at a... (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you know, people always ask me, you know, what are you going to do when you grow up kind of thing? You know, you, you keep going from job to job to job. So, I mean, pretty much that's that's my life in a, in a nutshell. I, I've been married to my wife for 27 years and we have one daughter who uh, is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy. 
and as a lieutenant in the newly formed Space Force. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. So it's, she's, it's pretty exciting, but everything she does is top secret. So right. conversations are, you know, how's work? I can't tell you about it. Okay, keep talking to you. <laughs> You've already asked too much. No. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. I tell you, I'd have to kill you kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> And then can you go into a little bit of detail on your, you know, obviously your book is about this and, and your blog and stuff, your battle with cancer? Sure. So in, in 2012, uh, I was diagnosed with this rare form of melanoma when I had a callus break open on the bottom of my foot, just below my third toe. And as I mentioned, I was a basketball coach at the time, so I was on my feet and I really didn't think a whole lot about it at the time. But eventually went to the doctor and uh, he was a friend of mine and it was kind of scary when he called me two weeks later and he said, you know, I've been practicing for 25 years and I've never seen this form of cancer and mm -hmm. you should go to the MD Anderson <coughs> Cancer Center in Houston. So I did. I had two surgeries to remove the tumor and all the lymph nodes in my groin and I had a skin graft to close the wound on the bottom of my foot where the cancer had been cut out. And after I healed, I was put on a weekly injection of a drug called interferon to help keep the disease from coming back. My oncologist used to talk about kicking the can down the road. Mm -hmm. Interferon for me, I don't know if you know much about it, but it, it was a horrible, nasty, debilitating drug. And I took those weekly injections for four years and seven months before I ended up in the intensive care unit with a fever of 108 degrees because mm -hmm. of the toxicity of the, of the drug. 108, that's like... It, that's insane. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That was, if I hadn't been in a level one trauma center, I, there's no doubt I would have been dead. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, wow. 108 degrees, you're pretty much boiling your organs. Jesus. What yeah. You're doing. Yeah. So, but I was at a level one trauma center and they were able to stabilize me and, and get me to the intensive care unit. But while I was on interferon, it gave me severe flu like symptoms for two to three days every week after each injection. I lost 50 pounds during my therapy. I used to, the joke with my wife that I was pretty sure I was skinny enough that I could go hang gliding on a Dorito, you know? <laughs> uh, but maybe a I few mean, Doritos that being six, eight, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I might need a couple. Yeah, that, that's true. But I, I guess, you know, to put it in perspective, it's imagine having the flu for two to three days every week for almost five years. And, and that's pretty much what this drug did to me. And then as soon as the disease, or as soon as the drug was stopped, the disease came back in 2017 in January of 2018, I had my left foot amputated because of it. Um, 2019, it came back, had two more surgeries. And then last year, I had an undiagnosed tumor in my ankle that grew large enough to uh, fracture my tibia, my shin bone. Hmm. And um, eventually, my only treatment option was the amputation of my leg above the knee. And I also found out that I had tumors in both lungs. And I'm currently undergoing a, a clinical trial to to try to mitigate those. And we're having some success, but I mean, my doctors don't talk about cure. They just talk about buying me some more time. Mm -hmm. When I was um, reading about your story and, and checking out your appearances on some other podcasts and stuff, the quote that came to mind, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a Nietzsche quote. Um, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Um, so what is your why to live? What keeps you with this positive motivated attitude despite all of that, um, all those hardships? Well, I, I can, I can say that's true because as I mentioned, my, my dad died shortly after I, I graduated from college, but he was diagnosed with end stage breast cancer back in the eighties. And for a man that was, they didn't really know what to do. They didn't know how to handle that. And they pretty much told him to go home and die. And he lived three and a half years because he had a why. He had a purpose. He went to work up to two weeks before he died. And I and I always remembered that. I always kind of kept that in the back of my mind, like there's a reason he just didn't go home and die and that he left that that he lived that long. Mm -hmm. And so for me now, I mean, my purpose is really to kind of help people find and live their purpose, their mm -hmm. passion, their why, whatever you want to call it. I, I recall a quote from Mark Twain who said that the two most important days of our lives are the day that we're born and the day that we figure out why. And a lot of times when I speak to groups, I'll ask them, you know, do you have any idea why you were put on this earth? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I even take it a step further and say, do you know why you were born now? Why weren't you born 4,000 years ago or hmm. 25,000 years in the future? 
Yeah. There's a reason that yeah. we were born. And that reason involves finding and living our purpose. I believe that we're all destined to live uncommon and extraordinary lives. And, and that has absolutely nothing to do with what kind of job you have, how much money you make, you know, what kind of car you drive, et cetera. We're not all born with the same gifts and talents, but we all have the ability to become the best person that we're capable of becoming. The problem is, is that most people take an unintentional approach to living. And by living a casual life, their, their dreams, their goals, their ambitions become a casualty of that unplanned living. Mm-hmm. During all the, well, I guess nine years now that I've been battling cancer, I've had plenty of time to think about my own death. And after I die, I can't imagine standing in the presence of our creator, whoever, whatever you believe that entity to be, and being unable to account for the gifts and the talents that I was born with and that I didn't use to make the world a better place. There's yeah. a there's a Native American Blackfoot proverb that I love heard years ago, and, and it goes like this. It says, when you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. <laughs> the only way to find your purpose is to search it out, to try things that frankly make you uncomfortable, to fight against the status quo, to experience things that scare you. Because finding your why or your purpose is important because it's the reason that you were born. And the only way to discover that reason is to be open to it and search for it with your heart. Yeah. It's, um, what's the idea of like, if, if you think of reality as this dichotomy of chaos and order, you, you always have to have one foot in the unknown chaos to, to grow, to, to try out new things and to risk doing that right to step outside of the city walls and whatever imagery you want to use um you have to put your put your mind your nervous system even like your your nervous system itself we're into cold showers and it changes how i act each day i you know convince myself to take a cold shower in the morning i'm more open to the world and and more um taking on risks that I might not take. I don't mean risks like crossing the road without looking, but, you know, s- sending in that app- <laughs> sending in a job application that I was going to talk myself out of or something like that. We were looking for the principles in your book. And my favorite one was fail as much as you can, especially when you are young, something like that. I really spoke to me. I think it's very important. Especially we're both it classical is. musicians. I, I mean, we fail I a lot. I, I say- <laughs> I say that in the book that, you know, I mean, nobody starts out to fail. You know, I mean, it's not like well, I'm going to do this because I'm going to mess up. No, I, I mean, but but we we take this. I, I guess I kind of look at it two ways. No matter what you do, you, you try something, you want to start a new job, whatever it is. You've got two choices at the end. You're either going to win or you're going to learn. Mm-hmm. And if you if you win, then your business is successful. If you learn that even if your business fails, can you take what you learned and maybe start that business again or start another business based on what you've learned? But we have this this culture that says, you know, if you're if you're not successful, then there's something wrong with you. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at Edison. I mean, how many how many thousands of times did he try to start to develop the light bulb and fail and right. fail and fail? Yeah. But eventually he kept at it and got to, you know, so you and I can sit here, you know, with lights on. Right. And, you know, if he would have been like, oh, I failed. Okay. I, I guess I'm going to stop. <laughs> Probably Tesla would have done it or right. something. Yeah. You know, somebody would have done it. But uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, but we are, you know, I, I talk about living a, a purposeful life, but there's an impediment to that. And, and that impediment is us. Right. You know, I mean, you know, we all know our brains are, are hardwired to avoid pain and discomfort and to seek pleasure. So to our minds, the status quo is comfortable and familiar and should just be left alone. I I always try to use the example of somebody looking for a new job. And we all know people who should be, you know, working somewhere else should have been doing it years ago, but for some reason they just stay put. Yeah. And I always wonder why, 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 why doesn't that person move on or, or, or try something else? And I, I really think it's their brain because, you know, your brain knows your fears it know your, it knows your vulnerabilities and it knows your insecurities and it likes the status quo. 
So when you start, as you say, having another foot in, you know, in chaos or something like that, your brain's like, oh, absolutely not. No, 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 no. Yeah. Not do <laughs> you shouldn't do this because, you know, things are comfortable here. You understand, you know, the, the way things operate here. You get along with your coworkers. You go somewhere else, might not get along with your coworkers at that new company. Whatever the reason to the brain, a new job presents all types of uncertainty and uncomfortableness. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I, I think one of the chapters I put in the book is this next statement. The problem with most people is they think, and I've done this, they think with their fears and their insecurities instead of using their minds. Mm -hmm. So you let your mind take over and say, yeah, I, I, I should get, I, mean, I should go for that new job. I should put that resume in, but no, no, no. I'm scared. I don't want to do it. And so often it, it, it does that automatically, right? And then we invent other reasons as excuses that sound better to our the people around us, but we know deep down what fear, if it, maybe it's just fear of failure, but that's something that stops us. Um, almost like, you know, the image when you were just talking before of like, uh, there are some dogs who just jump right in the water and some dogs like are scared of it. And they, they don't understand why, but they just have this biologically wired, like fear when they approach the water and they, they flinch away from it. Um, I feel like humans, you know, obviously we're wired with a lot of the same you know, biological nervous system, mind kind of wirings. And we just flinch away from things. Um, like, and a flinch, if you think about it, is an involuntary reaction away from something that scares you. Right, right. I, I, I'm going to give you another quote, but, I, but I'm, I'm going to preface it with, I'm absolutely going to date myself by giving <laughs> okay. you this quote. So, so in 1976, there was a U.S. gold medal winning Olympic swimmer by the name of Shirley Babishaw. And she had one of the greatest quotes I ever heard. And it kind of goes to what we're talking about. And this is what she said. She said, winners think about what they want to happen and losers think about what they don't want to happen. Hmm. Oh. Winners can override their brains, you know, and focus on the things that they want to occur. Mm -hmm. Whereas losers, they focus on the negative aspects of competition and they're not able to see the positive qualities of pursuing a goal or a dream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most people will never get to where they want to be because they won't stop whining and complaining about where they're at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so and, and if you want to live an uncommon and extraordinary life, the only way to make that happen is to embrace the uncomfortable things that you experience in your life, to continue to continue to do the things that you don't like and that frankly you don't want to do. Yeah. To become successful, your purpose has to be bigger than your pain. And I and I try to put this in a concept that's pretty easy to understand. So if you were to go to a gym and pick up a 10 pound weight and do 10 arm curls, but you didn't find that movement difficult, then your muscle is never gonna grow. Mm -hmm. However, if you go to that same gym, pick up that same 10 pound weight and do arm curls until you exhaust your muscle and you can't do another repetition, then you're stressing that muscle. And as a result, it will grow and get stronger. Yeah. That same tactic works with our minds. If you stress or push your mind by doing things that are uncomfortable, it will grow, it will develop, and you will become a stronger and more determined individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a good, <clears throat> the, the gym muscle metaphor is such a good one for the mind as well. Um, you cannot, you know, you cannot get strength without challenge, like, and that works for your immune system, right? There's a concept that Nassim Taleb came up with called anti-fragility. And it's this idea that um, this sort of more recent generation of, of kids was raised with this, I don't know if they call it helicopter parenting or something where kids are kept too safe. And that's uh, uh, bad for them in the long run because our whole nervous systems are designed to be challenged and then to meet those challenges and then grow stronger. And we get stuck in a feedback loop where if you never let your kids play on their own, go outside and play on their own, you're always watching them, always not letting kids work out fights amongst themselves and all that kind of stuff. Something different, you don't, you don't get the same skill sets and the same resilience. I think the word is resilience. And if you, if you raise a, a child and don't expose them to the world, their immune system won't properly form. They need challenges to, 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 to have strength. Um, I think it works on all levels of analysis, whether it's you personally, you know, literally your biology and, and it's a fascinating thing. Um, it is. It is. We're very complex individuals and yet we're pretty simple if you come yeah. right down to it. 
Well, that's what I love about some of these, like, you know, quotes or um, what, what did you just say before? It was the short catchphrase type. They almost sound cliche, but they contain so much wisdom, even though they're simple concepts. Sometimes the simplest things are what you need to, to get through a difficult situation, right? You they are. are. I mean, I, we make it complicated. You know, I mean, I, <laughs> life is pretty simple. We decide to mess it up by, you know, well, I've got to do this or, you know, what will this person think about me or, you know, who cares what they think about you? <laughs> you know, I, I did a podcast yesterday with a woman in Turkey and she was all hung up oh. on, you know, I've got to be like, you know, I've got to be like this person. And I told her, I said, at the end of your life, you're not going to be judged on what that person did. You're yeah. going to be judged on what you did. This is about you. It's not about them. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and she was so hung up on, I've got to be like them. And it's like, no, you got to be like you. What podcast like, was that out of curiosity? Because she's from Turkey yeah. as well. Oh, are you? okay. <laughs> but <laughs> that sounds familiar. I don't, I don't like, know what city she was in or anything mm-hmm. like that, but it was, yeah, she was a, a college student who had her own podcast. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's a really yeah. funny coincidence because I can tell that that's like, we are kind of coded that way culturally. And then I just shed that once I moved here and then just like kind of opened up like my perspective and I'm, I realized that, oh, I'm so caught up on like how other people like think me like yeah. as like, and yeah, that's a like cultural thing, I think. And it's so freeing once you can get past that, I think. Yeah. She, she and she couldn't get past it. I mean, she oh, just said, and I've got to be like this. It's like, no, well, you just have to be like you. Especially and, and, in the and eyes of parents. Out what you is yet. So, you know, that's sad, I'm sure man. it's very stressful for you. And, and she was telling me all her, you know, I have OCD and I, I can't sleep at night and I haven't, you know, I'm like, no. I said, when was the last time you ever went in your room, closed the door, closed your eyes, and just listened to yourself? Mm-hmm. Don't talk. Just listen. Yeah. I said, yeah, and I told her, I said, everything you need to be successful in life is already inside you. You just got to figure it out and bring it out. Yeah. yeah. Marcus Aurelius has a quote where he goes, people, you know, go on vacations to get away from it all, which, which is, I'm paraphrasing, of course, which is sure. silly um, because you can always get away from it all by just closing your eyes and going within. And, and the, have you heard of the philosophy of stoicism before? Yeah, I do. I've read meditations. By okay. Marcus, One of my favorite yeah, books. I, yeah. I love that stuff. Um, they call it tranquility, right? The inner peace that you can find um, when you just go within and it's always available to you. You don't have to go find it in the external world. Stoicism, I think uh, the best way to sum it up is whether you view something that happens to you as a blessing or a curse. And you always have that choice. It's the external thing is what it is. And then your internal framing of it decides how you take on that that event, that whatever happenstance. Um, right. Yeah. And, and you look at it like, you know, like we just talked a minute ago, you know, I mean, especially in the United States, we win or we lose. Well, why can't we win or learn? <laughs> Why, does, right, why right, do we have right. to lose? Yeah. Why can't we learn? So it's the wrong it's that. the wrong dichotomy, the win lose dichotomy. Yeah. yeah. Now I was reading the very opening of your book, and the opening paragraph pretty much captured the <clears throat> philosophy of our podcast. So this word kodawari is a Japanese concept that means pursuing perfection, attending to the details along the way, yet knowing you can never arrive, and that it's the pursuit itself that gives life meaning. And you opened with the um, Vince Lombardi football coach quote of, of you know, per, the telling his team, like, we're going to per- pursue perfection, but you won't get there, but you'll get excellence along the way. Mm-hmm. I was like, that's our podcast. That's what. There you go. <laughs> um, so his story of, um, or your story, rather, I'm reading my notes here. <laughs> You're right here. Um, your, your philosophy of win the day, and I even heard you say uh, on one occasion, win the minute, like when things get desperate enough, like I just have to win this minute. Um, it reminds me of this Kodawari philosophy that I tried to, I tried to expand it into like a philosophy of life, meaning you can never have anything permanently. You can never um, find full security in anything. That life is not about arrivals, but about process. It's about, you know, as the cliche would go, life is about the journey, not the destination. And I hate cliches sometimes because when people hear them, then they stop listening. Oh, I've heard that before. But if you really let something like that settle in, it's like, yes, <laughs> it's not about arriving and having something because you can't ever have something in a permanent sense. Um, 
Now, do you think you figured that out only after you got such a cancer diagnosis? Or was that something you had as a philosophy of life before that? Or was the prospect of, of dying something that kind of made that click into your mind in a more real way? I, I think my kind of nine-year battle with cancer has sort of solidified it, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mean, I think I kind of had bits and pieces out there. But it, it really wasn't until, you know, you, you come to the end and, and, you know, we're all going to have pain in our lives, but suffering is optional. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's really a kind of how, how you handle it. And, and I always know, you know, I'm, I'm always, I'm always going to have pain. I mean, with what I do, you know, I've, I've lost a foot, I've lost a leg. I, I, I'm in these clinical trials. I mean, I'm constantly, you know, I, I kind of feel like a Ouija doll where they just keep sticking me with, you know, <laughs> needles and something's supposed to happen. But I, I, I yeah, I, I mean, you get to a point in your life where you say, I mean, what's really important? I'm going to have pain, but I can't, someday that pain's going to end, wh whatever it is. I mean, whether it's through surgery or through drugs or I'm going to die and, and that pain's going to end. But if I quit, that pain's always going to be there, no mm -hmm. matter what. That pain will always be there for me. So, I've learned and I have, I have these four, used to be three. I, I, I just added one recently because it, it just, I was kind of toying with it. Should I, should I not? Mm -hmm. Kind of my truths, the, the things that, that kind of keep me going. And, and, and I'll share them with you. I, I have them on a post-it note sitting here at my desk. And the first one is you need to control your mind or it will control you. Mm -hmm. The second one is you need to embrace the pain and the suffering that you, we all have in life and use it to make you a stronger and more determined individual. And the third one, and this is the one I just added, was what you leave behind is what you weave in the hearts of others. And the fourth one is, as long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. And going back to that example of, you know, we know we're hardwired to avoid pain and discomfort and to seek pleasure. People always ask me, well, how do you, how do you deal with all this pain? And I've had so much of it that I've just learned to take it and flip it inside instead of running away from it or, or trying to, to back away from it, to just flip it inside and use it as energy or burn it as fuel to make me stronger, to make mm. me tougher, to make me more determined to continue to, to move forward mm. instead of just, and, and, and don't get me wrong. There are days when I'm, when I cry, when I'm, when I'm down, when I'm scared. And I mean, I'm not, there's no S on my chest and I'm not wearing a cape. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, there are those days and, and those, those days happen to all of us. That's, that's going to happen, but it's your choice whether to stay there or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just choose not to stay there. I just choose to, and, and you talked about winning the day. I mean, there were days when I was on the interferon where winning the day was get out of bed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just, just get out of bed. And, mm -hmm. and I found with, with, especially with your mind, you know, kind of in a dark place and stuff like that. If you can move, if you can do something physical, get up, walk, just do something that changes your whole perspective on things. I mean, you don't have to go run a marathon, but if you get out of bed and walk to the kitchen, you will feel better. Yeah. At least I felt better. Yeah. So, I, I mean, we, we all get into those dark and dingy and scary places, but it's your choice to stay there if, if you want, or your choice to say, okay, I got to keep moving. I gotta keep moving forward. And we'll see where, right. that, you know, where that takes me. But that, again, that's scary because that's the fear of the yes. unknown. Yes. And you do have to, you know, yes, you don't want to stay there, but you have to stay there in a sense. Like you have to be with your suffering in order to learn from it and and find your, your path out of it, something like that. Now, I have a question when you said um, you use this as fuel. In my mind, I sort of have... Um, the, this dichotomy of like the the Buddhist meditation inner peace version of embracing suffering and the sort of, there's this Navy SEAL named Jocko Willink and another one named David Goggins and that, that sort of warrior mentality that can also get me out of dark places. And they're not quite the same thing. Like the Navy SEAL version is like, I'm going to get my ass to the gym even though I feel really depressed today. And then after my heart's been going and then I feel like, what was I even worried about? You know, that kind of thing. And then there's also that I can sit and the sun's on my skin and I meditate a little bit and just accept it in more of like a, 
this is the dance of life. Like, do you find that those are different modes of acceptance for you or have you kind of integrated them into one thing or? Yeah, I think I have. I, I mean, I'm very familiar with, with Goggins and Jock. I've read Goggins' book and oh, okay. stuff like that. And I, I mean, I, I kind of look at him and said, gee, I wish I could be like, you know. <laughs> I don't know if anyone could be like him except No, him. I don't either. <laughs> I don't know. The guy's just, a, he's amazing. Yeah. You, you know, but then there's there's the other side where you, you've got to be, you've got to be quiet. You've got to center yourself. You've got to, you know, kind of, it, it's it's there, just relax and find it, mm. you know, I, I, and that. And, but I mean, in all honesty, you know, being an athlete and, and have been in law enforcement for the number of years, I, I mean, I probably tend to lean more towards the Goggins yeah. philosophy of, you know, I'll, I'll just keep hitting that wall and eventually I'll break through it. Yeah. But I also am smart enough to realize that, yeah, sometimes that's not the best way to handle it. Right. And you've got to figure that out. You know, today is a day where I've got to go hit the wall or today is a day where I've got to step back, regroup, think about this, Yeah, you know, breathe deep, you know, take it. Cause some days work where you hit the wall and some days work where you just center yourself and, and you try to deal with what's happening to you. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, I just remember the day that I, in, in one day I had a cat scan and a pet scan in the morning. And, and by five o'clock that night, I found out my entire lower leg was full of cancer and I would need to have my leg amputated above the knee. And I had tumors in my lungs, multiple tumors in my lungs that I need to have chemotherapy for. I mean, that was, that was like dropping a bomb. You know, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't having trouble breathing. I wasn't coughing. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't having any issues with, with breathing. So, I mean, how can I have these tumors? And yeah, my leg hurt, but now I've got, now you've got to cut it off, you know, right in the middle of a global pandemic. And, you know, here, my wife dropped me off at the hospital. Good luck. You're the only surgery that day. I, I mean, you, you've, was I scared? Yeah, to death. But I, I knew that this is what had to happen. And that, that was not a day when I needed to hit, hit the wall. That was a day I just needed to, right. okay, mm-hmm. you got to figure this out. You just got to, okay, why is this happening? How are you going to deal with it? Figure it out. It, it wasn't a hit the wall kind of day. Because you're not so going to. Yeah, I kind of figured out that. There, there's two sides to that coin and, and Interesting. Some days okay. one side works and some days the other side works. Right. Cause you're, for those who don't know, David Goggins is this guy that runs, sometimes it's like over 300 mile long races. Right. Um, I think they, he just did the Goggins challenge where you, you do, I forget what the details are, but it's basically 48 miles in 48 hours, something like that. And you, you know, yeah, you, I think he holds the Guinness book of world records for number of pull-ups or something like that. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the guy's just, I mean, he's chiseled. He's, you know, it, it, I mean, I like him. A lot of people don't because his, you know, his profanity kind of turns yeah. people off. <laughs> yeah. but. Cause he'll, he'll, he'll definitely curse him. But you know, sometimes I'll be laying in bed and be like, ugh, just having trouble getting up. And then my Instagram, he'll, his video will pop up. And so like someone's in a car, just like driving next to him and he's like yelling at you in the camera and you're like, all right, I'll get up. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's he's a heck of a motivator. Yeah, you know, he really is. And Jocko as well. Jocko Willink is another Navy SEAL, and um, he he has a. I don't think it's his quote. This sounds like ancient wisdom, but I heard it from him. He said, "It's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war." And it's just like you got to keep that warrior side of your personality always ready to go. That's why he gets up at four a.m. every day and works out, not because he's actively in a war, he's in a garden, so to speak, but you have to be ready for a a metaphorical war, whether that's, you know, with cancer or any other life challenge. Oh, absolutely. Uh, And, and, you know, I, I, I still am athletic. I still try, you know, I do push-ups on the stairs now because Mm -hmm. only have one leg. It's a little bit more difficult and stuff like that. And and my doctor or my nurse practitioner is like, (laughs) what, you know, why, why, why do you do that? Why wouldn't I do that? Yeah. You know, I mean, one, because I can. And, you know, it, it, it helps me. Like I said, when I move, I feel better. Yeah. Whether it's the release of endorphins or, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, I just feel better. And, you know, okay, I did 20 today. Can I do 22 tomorrow? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's that's how my brain thinks. So, yeah. you know, I mean, I'll, I'll never be Goggins doing like 7,000 pull-ups <laughs> in, you know, 24 hours. But yeah. I'll certainly do what I can. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Everyone has a, a window of, of that they can work within. And if, if hopefully you don't try to be David Goggins by running 200 miles when you've not been in shape, but 
you can run one mile probably or do push-ups or yeah I, I totally agree with that and i'll get caught in cycles where i stop exercising and i start feeling like shit and then just it takes like 20 minutes of cardio or something and i was like what did, what was i doing <laughs> How did how did that voice talk to me that says you don't need to go to the gym? It's there's these problems. It's not you know, and then as soon as you work out, you you frame everything so differently. You're like, this is none of this is a big deal. I'm gonna die one day, and I should just live my life. Like who cares about X Y Z, whatever the situation is? It's, yeah, it's the problems are ne- never as big as we make them out to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so true. I want to talk a little bit about resentment and. Um, you know, I'm somewhat young, but as far as I can tell, just observing the society, the culture, maybe how things are changing. I'm, I only have the interactions I have, but um, it seems like to me that that resentment is one of the more dangerous life traps you can fall into. And it seems like a lot, a lot of people or the culture just more generally seems to be falling into that frame of mind. Um just sort of a resentful nihilistic attitude. Like, of course, this is bad. Everything's structured to be bad. There's nothing you can do. It, that, those kinds of negative loops. How, how do you frame pain and suffering to make sure it doesn't make you resentful? Do you have to guard against that? And if so, like, how do you do that? I, I mean, I, I, I don't. I, I mean, I've had people ask me, you know, do you do you blame God because you you got cancer or, mm-hmm. or, or, or things like that? And, and I'm so a couple of summers ago, I had all 88 genes I had a genetic test to, to see of all 88 genes, of the ones that doctors know cause cancer, if they mutate and the, and the ones that they think they might cause cancer. And I had no mutations in any gene whatsoever. Hmm. And yet I have this very rare form of cancer. And, and I've asked my doctor, why, why did I get this? You know, mm-hmm. what, what, what can you, and he's like, I, I don't, I don't know. You know, I said, we, we, we think it might be trauma related. You have some kind of trauma. I'm like, I don't ever remember having a trauma to the bottom of my foot. I never broke that foot. I never, mm-hmm. you know, I don't think I've even had a sprained ankle on that foot and, and that. So, you know, do I, do I resent, you know, that that person doesn't have cancer and I do, or do I, you know, do I blame God or anything? I, I, I don't. And, you know, people have asked, you know, were you, were you mad when you, when you lost your leg? And I'm like, well, I wasn't happy about right. it. But it it didn't it didn't define me. I I am so much more than the sum of my parts. Yeah. And I, I always joke with my with, with my surgeon. I'm like, you know, you're kind of piecemealing me to hell, one body part at a time. You know, it's like <laughs> here's a foot. You know, here's a leg. And 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 we kind of joke about that. But you know, yeah, I think a lot of the the narrative today in, in, in society and culture is driven by the media, and and that's fine if it wants to be driven, but if and I kind of feel, and this is my personal opinion, we're, we're we're a lot smarter as a society, but we're much more ignorant, and we don't, you know. Well, we hear we heard it on the news, so that's must must be the way it is, or somebody said it on yeah. Facebook or Twitter or whatever, so that must be the way it is. <laughs> and why I say ignorant is that people will just stop there and not say, "Well, okay, that showed up on Facebook, but." Maybe I should do a little bit of research on my own to see if that is actually true. Right. I mean, did this person say that? Did this event actually occur? And if you can corroborate that, then okay, develop an opinion on it. But don't just say, well, it, it got thrown out into the this global universe and, and I picked up on it, so it's got to be true. So mm-hmm. I, I don't, I mean, resentment is a choice. You know, I can resent the fact that, you know, my neighbor doesn't have cancer, but I do. But I don't resent him. I, I, I don't. I don't. I, I live my life the way I feel I'm supposed to. I, I have found my purpose and I have lived that life. I don't try to compare myself to him and say, well, I don't have the BMW he has. So I resent him. I, I mean, I think I'm trying to remember which commandment it is, you know, out of the Ten Commandments, you know, <laughs> don't covet your neighbor's goods. Well, I mean, part of that is, well, he's got that. So I want it. I, I mean, it, do you do you want it? Or do you want it because he has it? Mm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's kind of, I think, the distinction. It's okay to want things. It's, you know, I would like to have a BMW someday, or I would like to have, you know, a house in the mountains or whatever it is. That's fine. But as long as that's what you want, and and as long as it's not what you want because 
your neighbor has it sure. you know, or your boss has it or something like that. So yeah. I, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Well, it does. It, I, I think, I think um, some people maybe st- struggle more with resentment. I don't know if, if there's a religious element to it. I'm not particularly religious, but I do have this idea that, that we all believe in God in some sense, whether or not we're in contact with that part of ourselves and whatever the heck one means by that overused three-letter word, God, I think maybe it means that same thing when we quoted Marcus Aurelius earlier, when we said you can close your eyes and go within. Like, that's getting closer to God, whatever you mean by that. And and getting closer to, uh, I have this quote here, I think it's by a, a, a teacher named Stephen Mitchell, but I could be wrong. But it was about forgiveness and avoiding resentment. And the framework was things don't happen to you, they happen for you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the um, Cain and Abel from the Bible, right? The, the psychologist Jordan Peterson talks about Cain and Abel a lot. One, I don't know if you've heard of, of him. He has a book about like these 12 rules of life. And one of them is be grateful in spite of your suffering. And that, that's the story of Cain and Abel where, you know, even if you make sacrifices and, and you do what you're supposed to do, I've heard you say, like, I wasn't unhealthy in my life. I didn't abuse drugs. I didn't smoke cigarettes and get lung cancer. That would be a totally different way to get cancer. You got unlucky, which is what happened to Cain in that story. And, and then the whole story is about not becoming resentful. Um, do you think people might struggle more with that if they don't have some kind of connection with a God or a higher power? I I mean, I do. I, I I don't, I mean, this is going to sound kind of backwards, but in a way I kind of feel I was lucky to get cancer because I think it made me a better person Mm -hmm. all around. Yeah. I've, I've been through hell, you know, the old Winston Churchill quote about, you know, if you're going through hell, keep going. Yeah. Hmm. I've been through hell and I don't think anybody would, would look at me and look at my experience and say that I haven't been, but, but I don't look at it as, you know, Oh, woe is me. This terrible thing happened to me. Yeah. This terrible thing happened to me and it made me a better person. Mm -hmm. So from that aspect, um, you know, that that was one thing I was saying, ask me your question again, because see, when you get old, you forget some things. So I was just wondering like if, if somebody who, who is agnostic or atheist, do you think they can have this same, um, what would you say, immune system against resentment? I, I, I don't know. I, I'm very, I'm very careful not to put my, my beliefs or my faith onto other people. I mean, I, I think people have to have to come to that. But I have, I have been, I, I I've seen so many, I, I've seen so much garbage. Mm-hmm. I've seen so much beauty in this world. I mean, the birth of our daughter, I, I, I you know, I live in, in the Rocky Mountain, in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. I've seen elk, you know, herd mm-hmm. of elk moving through, you know, the snow in the foothills. I, I mean, I went to college in South Carolina. I've seen, you know, the, the Spanish moss growing off, uh, off the oak trees. I, I mean, I've seen so much, I've lived on both coasts. I, I've just seen so much beauty that I, I can't, I, I can't fathom. I, I'm sorry. We're, we're good as human beings. We're, we're not that good, mm-hmm. you know. And, and if it were left to our, as far as I'm concerned, our devices, yeah, we would, we wouldn't, have, we would have screwed this up a long time ago, <laughs> much more than we have. There's got to be something bigger, and, and I feel that in my heart. And and I, 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 you know, I. There have been times, literally, when I've laid in bed, especially after I had my foot amputated, and I was like. All right, God. What now? What? What? What do you want me to do? I mean, I was kind of at a crossroads. I didn't didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have goals. I didn't have. I mean, it's like what now? What? You know. And I was kind of looking for the you know the heavens to open and say you know Terry you you know. And there's an old joke that says you know when we talk to God it's called prayer. When God talks to us it's called schizophrenia. So you know, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I never I never had I never had that you know voice. But what I had was people telling me, you should do this. And then somebody else telling me that. And then somebody else telling me that. And I, I think if you, I think God or the spirit or whatever you want to call it, moves you in a direction. It's up to you whether you want to go down that road. Yeah. You know, it's up to you whether you want to say, yeah, I'm going to do that. Or it's like, no, 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 I'm going, I'm doing, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do this. So, so you have the choice. And I, I, I think I write about this. I, I know I write about this in the book about 
when I was in college and I was, I was going to quit. I was going to, I had a full scholarship, four year scholarship to play basketball, division one basketball. And I was going to quit. And I was walking over to talk to the coaches and tell them I'm going to quit. I'd never quit anything in my life. And I was going to tell the coach, I was walking over and I said, you know what? I'm going to stop at the mailbox at the post office on campus. I'm going to see if I got any mail. I had a, I had a seven page mm-hmm. handwritten letter from my father who basically said, pull your head out of your butt. <laughs> in, in essence, you know, <laughs> I love you. I'm proud of you. You've overcome these knee surgeries, but you are so focused on you right now. He said, you, you've mm. called home, I don't know, seven times, nine times. Not once have you asked about anybody here. How's mom doing? How, how, uh, you know, how, how are your brothers doing? How's your girlfriend doing? You're so into you right now. You're so selfish right now. Get, get out of your head. You know, I, yeah. I, was, I was totally in my way. Get out of your head. And I, you know, I'm, I'm standing, I'm, I'm up in the, the rafters of the field house, just literally crying, you know, listening to this letter that my dad had. I'm like, I, I can't quit now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, was that God saying, I'm going to throw this out here? Now, it's your choice. But I'm going to give you this letter. Now you got two choices. Are you going to quit? Or are you going to take what your dad gave you? And are you going to move forward with it? Yeah. And I, I obviously chose that route. But, but there have been several times in my life where I really kind of feel where God put me at a sort of a crossroads. It was like, choose. Right. I think you should go this way. But mm-hmm. you can go this way if you want. Right. So for me, I, I believe in that faith. I believe that we've got to be bigger then there's, there's got to be something bigger than us. And if we're part of something that's larger than us, I mean, you've probably all done. I mean, that feeling is amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if it's just us, not so much. I mean, even if you're just being scientific, you're part of something bigger. I mean, Marcus Aurelius in his meditations talks about the logos, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's the, the lowercase L logos of your own ability and, to speak and think, but there's the uppercase logos, which is the the whole workings of the entire universe, and you're one note in that entire you know symphony of that. And like, yeah, when you're younger, you can so easily get caught up and think like, I am the symphony. It's like, no, you're right. a part of it. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, when people have asked me, you know, what do you think about the night before you're going to have your leg amputated or the night before you're going to have your foot? And I, I always, and, and this is true. For some reason, I thought about those mostly young men, but but some women that were sitting on those those boats off the coast of Normandy, you know, on, on June 6th that were, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old kids. Yeah. that were going to get on those boats in the morning and be driven onto the beach. And and many of them just massacred, never, never got out of the boat, you know, just were yeah. cut mm-hmm. down by German ar- artillery fire or machine gun fire, whatever you want. And yet they still believed in something bigger than themselves. They still believed the fact that my purpose here is to help, you know, drive out Hitler from from Germany and and, and France and and all the other places he'd occupy. That's my purpose. And and I'm a kid. I'm I'm, I'm a kid making that decision. How many young people today? And I see this all the time. What's in it for me? Yeah. You know, that's the What's in it for me? Not I want to contribute. How can I contribute? But what's in it for me? How many of those kids would get on that Higgins boat, you know, at, at, at oh, dark 30 and, and hit that beach knowing full well they'd be massacred, you know, never get out of the boat. Just be, you're dead. Yeah. You know, you're, you'll never have a kid. You'll never get married. You'll never retire. You'll, you know, maybe you even have someone back home and you're still doing that, you know? Yeah. That, that, that kind of stuff, like when I watched the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan, which shows that, yeah. when I was younger, I was like, whoa, intense war. And now it makes me like almost well up when I think of human sacrifice like that. That's why we're around. Our ancestors sacrificed themselves for humanity. Um, and of course, the message of, of Jesus is, is the ultimate sacrifice, right? To, right? to take on that sacrifice fully, voluntarily. Um, you know, if you're in that boat, you know, you probably could die, but you still believe that you want to fight for your life and all of that. The, if you take that to its extreme, it's like, I will take on death voluntarily to save humanity, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that might be the reason we exist and we outcompeted. Yeah, something bigger than yourself. Yeah. It's yeah. not about you. It's about humanity. And I don't think dogs or, or even chimpanzees have that ability to think of meaning 
into the future at that level. And, but we can, we can realize sacrificing ourselves is good. Whatever these words mean, you know, you get to these base layer words like good, but you feel it that that is what it has to be. Otherwise being won't continue. If, if the self-sacrificing goes away, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So, um, the last principle of your book stood out for me. Um, it was the love is the most important word in any language. So I was just curious, um, can you define what you mean by love and like the basic idea of what that principle means for you? So I'll, I'll tell you kind of a story of sort of how that came. You know, I, I've, I've read the Bible. I've, I've read a lot of books, but Bible certainly has the biggest impact on me. For me, the second biggest book that I ever read was a book called They Call Me Coach. And it was about John Wooden, who was a coach at the University of California, Los Angeles, long before you guys were ever born, but uh, back in the, in the 60s and 70s. And his teams were, you know, kind of like Alabama is in football right now. I mean, they, they're just, they were just dominant. They, they won seven national championships in a row. And Wooden was this great coach, but he's probably more known for his pyramid of success and things like that. And I remember listening to a conversation where he was talking about basketball. And, and I, I'm I don't remember exactly what the question was, but the, the interviewer asked him something about what he thought were the most important things, you know, to learn, or I, I don't remember it, but it was some, what, what do you think is the most important X? And I don't remember what X was. And I was all, you know, I was kind of on the, my in front of my seat, like, okay, you know, you're going to give me some good strategy, some mm -hmm. good offensive tips, some good defensive tips. And he said, the most important thing in any life is love. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I, I was, I was stunned. I was like, no, we're talking basketball. And, <laughs> and, and yet he was talking life. And, and I, I try to put love, I guess, into this concept. And, and it goes back to my relationship with God. When God created me in his image and likeness, he knew every stupid, goofy, you know, uncouth sin that I was going to make in my entire life, and yet still loved me enough mm -hmm. to put me on this earth. And I, and I think about that, and that kind of, for me, is like, yeah, I'm, you know, that's something that's much bigger than I am. But to me, that's, that's what love is. I mean, that's, that's, I, I, I accept you for who you are. Not for what I want you to be or, or what, you know, I'm going to project onto you, but I accept you. I love you. I care about you. I want what's best for you just based on who you are, not, not me, you, and, and I'll do whatever I can to help you get there. But I, but I just go in my mind, it goes back to a, a, a creator who knew all the bad we were going to do in the world, but still loved us enough to give us an opportunity to be in this world. Mm. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can't yeah. be in this world without the bad, right? Um, Maybe you can't. I've heard this said before that you don't love people despite their flaws. You love them because of their flaws. Right. And what it means is that your your flaws are just the shadow side of your strengths and your and your good qualities. And you know, I, I guess I've been playing with this idea that you don't. This doesn't like when you say you love someone because of their flaws. It doesn't mean you say yes, look at these flaws of yours, you should never change them and, you know, let's celebrate them. It means I accept that you couldn't be you without them. And in that like safe space where we can be vulnerable, uh, vulnerable about what the flaws are and whatever, that that's where actual growth can happen, not like growth because I'll leave you if you don't change kind of thing or fear growth based off of fear or something like that. I don't know. I'm still playing with the idea. It's kind of hard to make sense of all the time, but I, I suppose that's why it's a word like love that you more feel than, you know. But that, what, what you're describing is what I would call conditional love. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't change, then I'm going to leave. So I will love you as long as you change or think the way I think or do whatever, you know, whatever you want to say. That's, that's conditional love. Mm -hmm. I think what we got from God or what ga God gave us is unconditional love. I, I, it doesn't matter. I mean, you talk about what Jesus did. I, I, I died for all your sins, for all the dumb, stupid, idiotic things that you did. I died for that. And mm -hmm. I want 
to have a relationship with you. And, and I mean, and I think that's the other problem. You, you know, we kind of look at God, you know, God's out there, God's up here. No, God's right here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, God's, God's in us and he's in you and he's in you. And if, if we can realize that, maybe we treat people a little bit differently. Maybe we treat people a little bit kinder mm-hmm. and realize that, you know, this is, this is so much bigger than just human beings. This is so much, you know, love is such a, a huge concept and you've got it and you've got it and I've got it. And maybe if we bring it together, who knows what we could do? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, um, this, this idea of being under something bigger than you. Yeah, I think it's, I feel bad for people who, who aren't like that, who, who don't feel that higher presence, because I think that's where, where inner peace comes from is, is, is feeling like, I don't know. I mean, I don't have to necessarily put the label God on it. I can put the label conscience on it when you've done something wrong and you feel shame, right? That, that, you can frame that as a presence in the sky judging you, or you can frame that as a presence inside your mind judging you. Mm-hmm. Same with love, right? All of these things. I, I, and meditation, like one of the things I like about Buddhism is that you can export all the meditation type teachings without attaching like the metaphysical claims about, you know, rebirth or karma or any of these mm-hmm. things. And, and so many of the meditation teachers do exactly what we said in the beginning. They say, if you feel if you feel lonely, sit down with your loneliness. If you feel sad, sit down and be with your sadness. And all of these concepts of embrace the suffering and then learn from it kind of thing. I think so many of the traditions all seem to arrive at the same basic conclusion about how to live the best life. And... On that front, I had this little section here. I called it words are cheap. And so when I hear someone like me say what I'm saying now, sometimes it feels cheap. It's like, how have I been tested? You know, we all have been tested personally. But when I hear someone like you say it, it makes me feel better because it's those are words that have been tested by reality. Do you know what I mean? I um, do. <laughs> <laughs> and so like... From my mouth, it might sound like a cliche, but when you see someone who's lived it out, you go, okay, I did think this was ancient wisdom, and I guess maybe I was right, because it stood the test of, you know, of that real-life challenge. It's sort of like if I give you a fighting move, and I'm not a fighter, you're going to be like, how the heck do I know if that works? You've never tested it in a fight, right? right. <laughs> um, so do you feel like y- you sort of feel more confident delivering this message now that you've been through these challenges? Do you feel like, you know, extra confirmed? Would you say it's more of a faith thing or are you sure about these things? You know what I mean? I don't know if I'm asking the right question. I am sure about them. I, I, I without a doubt. I mean, like I said, I, I kind of had three truths, you know, and I, I thought and I was thinking and I'm reading and, you know, it's like, now this fourth one's got to come in here. You know, I, I, I and I kind of put it off for a while, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm totally confident with where I am. And, and yeah, I mean, I have a certain amount of credibility because I don't have a leg. I don't have a foot. I've been through all this kind of stuff, but I, I don't want people to think that I have all the answers because I, I, I don't, I, I mean, maybe Goggins does, but, but I don't. And like I said, there are, there are days when I'm down, there are days that scare me. There are days when I'm anxious and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's okay. I, I'm a human being. I, I'm, I'm not a God. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not Marcus Aurelius. I, I mean, I'm a work in progress, mm-hmm. but I've been smart enough, I think, to realize that all these different events that I've experienced in my life up to my cancer journey have made me the person that I am. And I mean, I'm, I'm kind of amazed that people want to talk to me. I'm like, I mean, I had it literally, I had a podcast host one time that wanted ask, wanted me to come on her show. And I'm like, absolutely. I'd love to come on your show. We, we get together. I mean, she was so nervous to talk to me. And I was like, why, why, why are you nervous? Well, you know, you're an author and you're this, that, you know, and I looked at her and I'm like, I'm just as much full of baloney as the next person. <laughs> so, I mean, let's not, you know, don't, 
don't put me up on a pedestal. And I think that's a problem with people. I mean, we put people up on pedestals and then we spend the rest of the time time trying to knock them off. You know, what, what, what are your, what are your downsides? What, what are your faults? What are your, th- you know, well, I had all those faults and stuff before you put me on this pedestal. Yeah. Why'd you put me up there? Yeah. Well, you were a great basketball player. You were, you know, you, you wrote a book or something like that. And like, I tried to tell her, I'm like 800 books in the United States get published every day. Mine was one. Yes. I wrote a book, but thousands of people are writing books. So I, I just kind of had to try to put it in perspective that I'm not, not that big of a deal. Yeah. I've, had an, I've had a unique experience that I like to talk about, but I don't have all the answers and, and, I, and yeah. I never will, but there's, I keep trying to find those answers. There's a Carl Jung quote. I forget the exact wording, but it's something like the deepest questions in life don't get answered. You just outgrow them. And, and so I think when you were saying like, I haven't found the answers, it's because to the deepest questions, there might not be answers. There's just outgrowing it in the sense of like, you know, uh, accepting it almost, like right? accepting reality as is, not figuring it out. And that's like more of that uh, rational left brain, t- you know, I, I can figure this out and solve it, but you can't solve everything. And so the, the deepest questions, I think you just have to like let go and whether that's to a higher power or just to the determinism of the physical universe, whatever it is, you, you have to have that like letting go ability. That's I think, That's a good point. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, and, and you're right. There are some things that I just like. I am. I, I don't know. I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> oh, I love the you phrase. Know. I don't know. Once I started saying that more, it felt amazing. You know, somebody asks yeah. you something. I don't know. <laughs> I, now I don't have to make something up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, it is. I, I worked for a woman one time uh, when I was in healthcare, who went on to become the president and CEO of Henry Ford health systems and, and wrote a book and, and did all kinds of things. One of the nicest, most giving people I've ever had the opportunity to, to work with. And, and one of the things I did with her, we worked for a fairly large hospital. It was 1,100 beds and 5,000 employees. And so we had a, a, a monthly magazine and people could call in, write in whatever and ask questions. You know, why aren't we doing this? Or why don't we have this piece of equipment? Or why aren't we doing this procedure? And I would kind of be behind the scenes researching it, write it up, and then give it to her. It's like, you know, do you want to make changes and stuff like that? And we had a very similar writing style. But the thing that I learned, one of the things I learned from her is the power of the word no. <laughs> you know, that, you know, are are, are we going to, I mean, I mean, you guys are still pretty young, but I, I mean, I've been, worked for a lot of companies where, you know, somebody will ask a question and instead of saying, no, we're not going to do that. And here's why. They just say, oh, 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 we'll put a committee together and we'll study it. So it's death by committee. Mm-hmm. And, and you never get back to the person. And then the person is resentful. You know, I had this idea. I thought it was a good one. And, and we studied it to death and nothing came of it. Mm-hmm. But she was real good about saying, no, no, we're not going to do that procedure. And because the hospital down the street does it and they have the market court, whatever it was, there was an explanation to it. But people felt so much better that they got a real genuine and an honest answer to their question. It yeah. wasn't, you know, death by committee of what I just be quiet and go away. We don't want to talk about that. So, I mean, that to me, and I've said this to my daughter a number, number of times, you know, we don't have a finite amount of time every day. And, and the most successful people in the world say no a lot. No, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to spend my time doing that. No, I'm not going to, you know, yeah. and that's why they're successful. Yeah. True. yeah. That's so true. <laughs> we have some bonus questions for you. Um, bonus questions. I like it's bonus time. <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> okay. So the first one is, um, what's the most profound thing that you change your mind on? Having kids. Uh-huh. Mm. There, there was a point in my life where I was 100% convinced I did not want children. And I I, I, I think God kind of was like, no, you're, you're, you're going to have at least one. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had our daughter and it, it was, I'm so glad he or whoever changed my mind on that because it was, it's been wonderful. It's been a miracle. And, and I, yeah. So out of completely was, impersonal uh, curiosity, what age were you when that happened? <laughs> when I changed my mind? Yeah. I was, I was probably in my early to mid thirties. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, What's the most profound thing you learned about human beings from your time in law enforcement? Uh, 
Um, I know these are kind of hard as bonus questions. No, 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 no that's good. It's, <laughs> I, I like questions that make me think. Um, I, I guess the 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 thing that sort of I'm, I'm reminded of when, when I was a, a a beat cop when I was running a beat an area um, it was it was 99% African American and it was myself and I had my my partner was out of my academy class she was also white from West Virginia and we ran this area and and it was a lot of dope a lot of guns a lot of violence and. And the thing I remember most is the, you know, people are like, well, you know, who did you do this for? And I, I did that. I, I did this job for the woman, the single mom with two kids, you know, who lived a block from the crack house, who was doing every, you know, she had two jobs and she was doing everything she can to make, you know, to give a life to her children. And I was so impressed with the, the tenacity that of, of those people, uh, you know, and, and there were so many of them. And I'm like, I'm not out here, you know, resting the dope dealer or, or you know, or the guy who just shot some, you know, I'm, I'm doing this job for that woman, for that single mom or that grandmother who's trying to raise her grandkids and, and, you know, who, who, who's just trying, they're just holding on by their, their fingernails. Mm -hmm. And, and now they've got it, you know, they're living a block from a crack house and, you know, and, and gunshots are going off and stuff like that. Just the tenacity of those people to me was inspiring and amazing. So I, I guess that would probably be what really impacted me or what, or hmm. what I felt. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. One last one to end on a lighter note. Can you think of the time that you laughed the hardest in your life? Usually when I'm with my brothers. Okay. I, I mean, what I mean, we are, you know, we're three big guys, and 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 it's it's kind of funny because literally, if you're at dinner with us, and you say pass a roll, somebody will pick up a roll and throw it at you. You know, <laughs> be like here, I passed you a roll. Here you go, kind of thing. And and we just we laugh. So when we get together, I mean, my both my brothers are in Chicago, and I'm here in Colorado. But when we get together. We just, we laugh the entire time. So, so just being with them. That's good. Yeah. I have a similar experience. I would say yeah, she, yes. she knows like we, me and my brother, my twin brother, I'm a twin. Uh, okay. Like she'll just look at us and be like, I don't even know what they're saying. <laughs> like, like yeah, there's just the like times. this uh, unspoken, you know, mix of Seinfeld quotes, movie quotes and randomness, right. you know? <laughs> right. I mean, we all, we all are big. And so, you know, we're getting to the point where, you know, one of us is the biggest. And so we're always, you know, who's the biggest man at the table? You know, I mean, which is basically who's the fattest one here, you know? And, and, and so we always, you know, oh, Brian's the biggest man at the table. And that's kind of our code for, you need to lose some weight. You yeah, know, yeah. Stuff like that. How long have you guys been together? Us two? Uh -huh. Oh, um, it's five years, five years uh, yeah. this past November. Yeah. How did you meet? Yeah. Uh, and in university, she came here in 2014. We were both in the same music department. Okay. And, um, and then it took off pretty quickly. We were actually supposed to be married by now, but we canceled it. Yeah, because of COVID, of you course. Because of COVID and yeah, stuff? We, we canceled it earlier on just to be get our money back and be safe because <laughs> things were so up and down. And I was like, I don't want to go forward and then find out. You, oh, you can have five people at your wedding. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> exactly. What, what part of the country are you guys in? Uh, currently, we're in Miami. Yeah. Miami, Okay. Uh, we mm -hmm. just moved here from New York in, in January. Um, she got a, a position in an orchestra here. Nice. Yeah. So we're definitely... What, what instrument do you play? I'm a violinist. Oh, outstanding. Yeah, thank you. I play trumpet. I'm a trumpet player. So. See, I play trumpet. Oh, really? I mean, oh. I was probably the only person in the band where the band director was like, just pretend you're playing at concerts. I mean, I was oh. so horrible <laughs> at trumpet. Just, just, you know, like... Push pretend. the buttons. Just yeah. Don't play. If you play, you're out. You know, so. <laughs> Yeah, that was terrible. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> yeah, we're really enjoying the sun. the 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 sun here, it's like eighty and sunny, and our yeah. our friends in New York having snowstorms. You know, it's pretty. We're still getting used to it, but I I love. Um, I feel like my mood is better just yeah, getting all this vitamin, vitamin D and D sun and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. thanks so much for coming on. It was so nice to meet you and and you get, too. Thank get you. a more thank you personal uh, account of your life and stuff. 
Uh, do you want to just direct people to where they can find your book or find your presence on social media, website, et cetera? Sure. The easiest way to do it would probably be to go to my site, motivationalcheck.com. Uh, from there, you can get to my social media sites. You can click on the link to Amazon to order the book. So okay. that's probably the easiest way. And then if you want to send me an email directly, it's motivationalcheck at AOL.com. All right. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Well, again, so nice to meet you and we you wish too. you all the best. And I'll send you an email once this publishes. It might be in like a week or two. Okay, perfect. All right. Thanks all right. a lot. Good luck Thank to you, you both. Thank you. Bye. All Bye. right. Take care. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Exploring Kodawari. If you enjoyed it, we hope you'll consider sharing it on social media and with friends. You can also help us out by leaving a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Those help us more than you would think. And if you'd like to help us out in a more substantial way, consider going over to our website to make a donation through PayPal. Links are in the episode notes for this. You can do this as a one-time donation or a recurring monthly donation. All of that support will help us to set aside time in order to create content for the podcast and the blog. And finally, please get in touch with us and say hi, either on social media or privately through email. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening and see you next time.